Good morning and welcome to Community Bible Church. We want to invite you to stand to begin our time of worship through song. Make sure you grab one of our bulletins. There's a lot of different things 
in there about different things coming up. Uh, also, we'd encourage you on the side of that bulletin is what we call our connect card. We would ask you to fill that out, tear it off, leave it on your pew. It lets us know that you are here this morning. It's also how you can share prayer requests, sign up for some different things we have going on, uh, and give us any updates to your information. So please fill that out, uh, tear it off, leave it on your pew. Um, also, a couple of things coming up. Uh, today we have a Class 101. And class 101 uh, is our, our starting point class. If you are new with our church and want to find out more about who we are and what we believe, today is a great time to uh, come to that class and find out. It is also your first step to being a member. Maybe you've been with us a long time and have never taken that step to membership either. So Class 101 that happens today from 3 to 6 up in the, the front building. Um, so if you haven't signed up yet, you can just show up today at 3, and we'd love to have you um, for that class. Uh, also, we have coming up, and you'll see this in your bulletin, there's an a insert about our coffee house that is coming up uh, this next Saturday. And all the details are in there. You can sign up uh, out in the breezeway to sing a song, read a poem, read some scripture, uh, anything you'd like to do. Now, there are rumors around that uh, people are really excited about. Meyer Terrebone is going to be doing an interpretive dance of some kind at the coffee house. So you want to make sure you come for that. Okay, not for not but maybe it will. She'll feel the pressure. Maybe she'll do it now. Um, but there's going to be some great things going on at that coffee house. It's going to be a really fun night, great time of fellowship. So I encourage you to join us for that. Uh, also, uh, during our 40 days of prayer, is a great opportunity to join in with the men that pray every month in our community. There's a men's prayer meeting that goes on uh, at Jack's Exxon the last Saturday um, of every month, and so that's coming up this next Saturday, 7.30 to 8.30. Uh, meet at Jack's Exxon. It's just a great way to join with other men in our community to pray together. And also during the 40 days of prayer, our uh, prayer committee, our prayer team, is trying to recruit uh, people to be fasting all during uh, the 40 days of prayer. And there are a few slots that are still available. If you would like to pick a day uh, in the next, the, what's left of our 40 days, uh, just as, to, to fast and spend specific time in prayer for our church and for this time. Uh, see Matt Dickinson, Matt, you want to raise your hand? See Matt, he would love to get you on the calendar uh, for that, um, just to fill in, just to get, continue to cover our 40 days of prayer with people that are, are praying and fasting for our time, for us to have a, a, just a meaningful experience in our time with God during this time. So, uh, see Matt if you would like to, to take part in that. So now I'd like you stand as I pray for our service this morning. Heavenly Father, we do thank you just for the privilege of coming together as the body of Christ to worship you, to be encouraged in our time in fellowship, to learn from the truth of your word. And Father, I pray that as we uh, sing and praise and pray and listen to your word, that we would be encouraged in our faith, that we would leave here with a desire to honor you with lives of worship. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.
any prayer needs, any praises that you would like for them to, to pray with you. We'll have some in the front as well as the back of the sanctuary this morning.
But God, we thank you for the precious blood that was the shed for our sins. We thank you for the cross of Jesus and what that means for us. Father, we thank you for your the, the resurrection of Christ and the life that we found in the life, death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ. Father, we just ask, Lord, that we would never take for granted the cross of Christ. That it would always be on the forefront of our thoughts and mind. This is the most important thing in the history of the world that has ever happened for us. And I pray, Lord, that as we meditate and dwell on the cross of Jesus, that it would lead us to come before your throne and worship you with hearts that are just overflowing with humility and gratitude for what you've done. So, Father, we thank you for all the many blessings that you pour on us. We ask that you continue to speak to us, that you continue to draw us to you, and that we would not only be hearers of the word, but doers, Father. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Well, probably the number one rule for driving a car is keep your eyes on the road. And yet today, it seems like more and more people are not watching the road. And the number one reason, the number one culprit, is because people are texting while they are driving. I'm sure no one in here does that. But um, some people do, and we kind of chuckle it off and laugh about it, but, you know, it's a serious, serious problem. Uh, consider these alarming statistics. The United States uh, Department of Transportation reports that cell phones are involved in 1.6 million crashes every year that cause a half a billion injuries and, and take 6,000 lives. According to the Virginia Tech Transportation Institute, texting while driving, get this, is six times more likely to cause an auto crash than driving drunk. So driving while texting is even more dangerous than driving while drinking. Unbelievable. If you are texting while driving, you are 23 times more likely to have a wreck. And this is tragic. Every day. 11 teenagers die because they were texting while driving. Every day, 11 kids' lives snuffed out. Wow. How important it is that when we're driving, we're looking at the road and not at our cell phones. And really, there are actually a lot of different ways that we need to look at the road uh, to be a good, safe driver. Uh, for example, we need to look in that little rear view mirror to see what's going on behind us. Somebody's not going to crash into us there. And we look at, need to look at the side view mirrors to see what cars are on either side of us are doing. And if you need to change lanes, you know, there's a little blind spot there. So what do you have to do? You have to turn your shoulder and look over there and, uh, so you won't crash into anybody there. That's not all we have to look at. We've got to look at the speedometer to make sure we're not speeding. We've got to look at the gas gauge and make sure we've got enough gas. There are lots of places that you and I, we need to look in order to be a good, safe driver. Well, did you know that in order for you and me to have a good, well-balanced, satisfying time of prayer with the Lord, that there are some important places that every single one of us need to look. And that is what we want to talk about this morning on the week four of the 40 days of prayer. Five places, five places to look when you pray. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we just thank you for bringing us all here this morning. Lord, we thank you for the privilege of singing praises to you and just for blessing us with such a talented and gifted and committed worship team. Father, we thank you that you have come into our lives and that you, the creator of the universe, want to talk with us, want to hear our prayers, want to commune with us. 
We don't understand, but we are so grateful that you do. So, Father, may your Holy Spirit be the teacher this morning. May you soften our hearts, open our minds, and, and help us help meet us at our point of need. Teach us what we need to learn about prayer so that we can have a closer connection with you. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, I don't know where you are this morning, but maybe you are pretty new at this whole praying thing. And you're kind of wondering, boy, you're not really sure about how to actually go about doing this. You're not sure about what to pray. Or maybe you've been a Christian for 20, 30 years. And, but your life may be kind of getting stale a little bit, your prayer life. Maybe you kind of feel like you're in a little rut, praying the same old thing all the time, over and over and maybe for you, you kind of need a fresh approach in your prayer life. Well, I don't know where you are this morning, but my hope, my prayer for us today is that these five places to look when we're praying are going to help every single one of us have a richer, a deeper, a more enjoyable, a more meaningful prayer life. So let's get started, shall we? A great place to begin when we pray is to look backwards to the cross. Look backwards to the cross. Now, I happen to have come up with five little hand signals for each one of these five points, and we're going to practice them this morning so you get them down. We might be here till 2 o'clock in the afternoon, but we're going to have these five hand motions, okay? The first one is to look backwards at the cross. All right, everybody get your thumb, look backwards over your shoulder. Okay, one more time, look backwards at the cross. Great, y'all are such good learners, I'm telling you. Okay, in other words, don't begin your prayer immediately with presenting to God all the different problems that are on your plate. Uh, not, not with all telling him all the things you're scared and terrified about that's going to happen tomorrow, what's not going to happen tomorrow. Of course, there's a place for that when God wants us to pray those things. But don't start there, okay? First, take a few minutes to just look back at the cross. And really spend a little time thinking about what that means. Well, Peter talks about the cross in 1 Peter 1, 18 to 19. He's a pretty good authority there because he was right there at the foot of the cross. He saw Jesus crucified. And later on, he writes in his letter... Uh, First Peter, for you know that God paid a ransom to save you from the empty life you inherited from your ancestors. And it was not paid with mere gold or silver, which lose their value. It was the precious blood of Christ, the sinless, spotless Lamb of God. Now, when you think about Jesus dying for you, it just, it just has a way of reminding us of three very important things uh, that we need to know and kind of keep at the forefront of our minds. First of all, the cross reminds me how deeply God loves me. Well, why do we need that reminder? Well, I don't know if you're like me, but sometimes we can get so wrapped up in all the different battles we're waging, whether it's battles at home or battles at work or battles in school, battles in relationships, or we can just get so consumed and overwhelmed by different huge problems we're facing uh, maybe you lost your job and you're just sitting there and you have to watch your savings account dwindle further and further down. You're starting to panic. Or maybe your marriage has fallen apart. Or maybe your marriage is falling apart and you're just feeling in deep, deep despair. Or maybe you're facing some serious, serious health issues or some kind of huge loss that you're having to, to grapple with. And in the midst of all of that confusion, it is real easy. It is so easy just to kind of forget about, just to kind of lose sight of the fact of how much God really, really loves us. And that's why we look, look back at the cross. That's why it's so important. Romans 5, 8, the New Living Testament translation says, But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. Guys, we cannot even begin to, to plumb the depths of God's amazing, perfect, unconditional love. Nobody loves you the way God loves you. Your husband doesn't. Your wife doesn't. Your grandparents don't. Your parents don't. Your best friend 
does it. God loves you and me in a way that no human being can. See, his love is absolutely perfect. There's no flaw in his love. There's no letdown, no weakness. His love is always unconditional. It's never ending. It doesn't fade. It doesn't change even when we do something horrible. We walk into some terrible sin. God doesn't love us any less. And it's the cross that demonstrates, that just shows us this beautiful, incredible. Look at that cross. That's how much, that's how deeply God loves you and me. The cross, number two, also reminds us of how costly sin and evil is. 1 Peter 1.18, you know, back to 1 Peter 1.18, it says, God paid a ransom to save you. Well, what, what's that all about? Well, it's a picture of, you know, back in uh, Bible times in the Roman Empire, a slave could be redeemed or ransomed when someone paid money to buy his or her freedom. What does that say to us? It says, you know, you and I, we were slaves. We were hopefully, hopelessly enslaved to our sins. And because of our sins, we were separated from God. And we were doomed to have to pay for all of our sins in hell for eternity. Never ending. But God himself paid the ransom price that bought our freedom from the prison house of sin. Well, what was the ransom price? What did God have to pay? Again, Peter says it was not paid with mere gold or silver, which lose their value. It was the precious blood of Christ, the sinful, spotless lamb of God. You know, we all know, if you've been coming here for any amount of time, we know that salvation is a free gift of God's grace. God's never forgiven. Never forget it wasn't free for God the Father. It cost him a lot. It cost him having to sit back and watch his own precious, perfectly innocent son Jesus being mocked, being ridiculed, having people spit in his face, being flogged, being tortured to death on the cross. Do you have a child? If not, you have a nephew or a niece that you love dearly. I want you to imagine loving somebody else so much that you would allow your own child, your own nephew or niece, to have the flesh ripped off their back as a heartless Roman soldier cruelly flogged him or her. Can you imagine that? Imagine watching your child, your loved one, after being brutally flogged, then having to carry this huge, heavy wooden beam through the crowded streets of Jerusalem. Don't think about Jesus. Don't think about your child doing that. Think about your child being stripped in public of all of his clothes and having his hands and feet nailed onto that cross. Imagine your child bruised and bleeding beyond recognition hanging on a cross for six excruciatingly painful hours until he finally died. That's how much God loves you. That's the price. That's a price he was willing to pay to, for, to, for your sins, to, to buy your freedom uh, out of hell and buy your entrance into heaven. That's what it cost. <clears throat> Nothing else would do. You want to know how much something's worth? Well, something is worth whatever anybody is willing to pay for it. You might have some valuable possession in your home, and you think, man, I think this is worth this much, you know? But then you don't need it anymore, and you go to eBay, and you go to Facebook, you have a garage sale, and you try to sell it, and you find out, you know, it is not quite worth what I thought it was. Something's worth whatever anybody's willing to pay for. So, how much are you worth? How much are you worth? Are you worthless? How, how much are you worth? Well, look back at the cross. Look back at the cross. That's what God was willing to pay to save you. That is how much you were worth. We should have the 
best self-esteem of anybody on the planet because we know how valuable we are to God. The cross reminds me how deeply God loves me. The cross reminds me how costly sin and evil is. And number three, the cross reminds me how completely I am forgiven. Colossians 2.13, great verse. It says this, you were at one time spiritually dead. You didn't have a spiritual pulse. There was nothing going on. You were dead, lost, gone because of your sins. But God has now brought you to life with Christ God forgave us all our sins. Now that last little part of that verse, I want that to sink in. God forgave us all our sins. We got that up on the slide, just that little part of that verse. And uh, I want us all to say that together. Okay, on three. One, two, three. God forgave us all our sins. That's pretty good, but this time I want you to do it. And this time we get all, I want you to kind of do all loud, okay? <laughs> Here we go. God forgave us all our sins. There you go. Let that sink in. Now, does God tell us here in his word that, that he forgave some of your sins? Does he say he forgave most of your sins? Does he say he forgave just the sins? Do you happen to remember to confess? No. What does it say? Let's say it together one more time. God forgave us all of our sins. That's good news, guys. <clears throat> that means that all the sins of your past, every, every, every horrible thing you've ever done, that means all the sins that you may have committed today as you're getting ready to church or driving to church, that means all the sins you will ever commit any time in your future, all of that, God forgave us all of our sins. And you know what else that means? That means there's no such thing as purgatory. Well, why is that? Well, let's think about it a minute. Let's just reasonably think about it. If all of our sins are once and for all paid for by Jesus Christ, there's nothing else left for us to pay. It's all paid up. And that's why Paul can so confidently say in Romans 8.1, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You will never, ever be condemned for any sin you've ever committed. Why? Because Jesus Christ was condemned for you on the cross. He was your substitute. He got the condemnation so that we could get the salvation. Is that great or what? So a great place to start praying to God, guys, is to begin by looking backwards to the cross. Because looking back at the cross gives me an attitude of gratitude. In other words, you look back at the cross and, and you just think, oh God, I, I, I can hardly believe that you loved me that much. Or you think, God, my salvation cost you so much, you had to sit back and watch your own dear son die for me. Thank you, thank you, thank you that he shed his precious blood. And you know, we think about that and it kind of, I don't know, when I was thinking about it, it kind of popped into my mind that, that great song we sometimes sing, At the Cross, and the, the the chorus, it says, at the cross, at the cross, I surrender my life. I'm in awe of you, God. I'm just in awe of you. Where your love ran red and my sin washed white, I owe all to you. I owe all to you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, that because of your death, all my sins, they're once and for all forgiven. Thank you that it is true, as the psalmist says in 103, as far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us. That's how. That's how a meaningful time of prayer begins, by looking backwards at the cross, by approaching God with a humble attitude of heartfelt gratitude. Second place to look when we pray is to look upward to your Heavenly Father's loving face. Now, you, you probably will imagine what the hand motion for that is. Look upward. All right, let's all do that. Look upward. All right. Look backwards at the cross. Look upward to the Father's loving face. Now, you see, why does God want us, why do we need to look up at God's loving face? Because that's the God we need to see. That's, we need to see what that's what he's like. You see, God doesn't want us to see him, to view him as some cruel dictator 
ordering us around. He wanna he doesn't want us to see him as a mean boss that you don't even want to go to work to. You just gonna have to see that guy. You don't you want he doesn't want us to view him as a demanding supervisor or as a constant killjoy. No, he wants us, he wants us so much to see him as the God who he is, our loving, heavenly father. Jesus, as we've mentioned before, gave his disciples a, a pattern for prayer when they asked us, Jesus, teach us to pray. And we've talked about that, and you're going to hear about it again in their life group this week. And in that prayer, Jesus, of course, addressed God as what? Our, our Father. That's the way Jesus kind of taught This is how you talk. Our Father. Let me ask you, do you ever address God as Father in your prayer? And some of you say, no, not a good association. My father wasn't exactly the best father in the world. I'll call God something else, anything else. I'm not calling him father. But listen, God is not your earthly father. And your earthly father is not God. God simply wants to see uh, us at him as he is. That he's a perfect father. That he's a good, good father. Good to the core. And as we saw a couple of weeks ago, we saw that as a father, he's a caring, close, compassionate, consistent, competent, perfectly loving father. So I encourage us, if you're not in the habit of doing this, to call God at times. You don't have to call him God this every time, but call God what Jesus taught his disciples to say. Call God Father. You know, it just might be that if you make this one change in your prayer life, that you can begin to address God, not just as God or Lord or Creator. Those are fine, but, but you begin to address Him as Father. That alone could radically change your prayer life. This is important, guys, because what you call God sets the tone for your prayer. It really does. You see, some people, when they pray, they, they sound like they're applying for a loan at a bank, and the stingy loan officer is God. He doesn't want to give you a thing. Some people pray to God like they're giving a deposition to an attorney, and you're scared to death you're going to say something wrong. So be very careful. We choose to pick our words when we pray. Some people like, uh, pray like they're taking a lie detector test in front of the FBI. Now, who is going to want to enjoy prayer when you're thinking that God is like that? Not much of it. What you is going to want to run from prayer like we run from the plague. How much different, guys? How very, very different it, would, it is when we approach God as a warm, loving, accepting, heavenly Father. Listen to what Romans 8, 15 to 17 says. So you have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. In other words, we don't we're up around God. Oh, oh, oh don't, don't strike me dead. Oh, God, I'm, you know, I'm, I can't believe you. It's not a fearful That is biblical. We're not supposed to think that way. Instead, you receive God's spirit when he adopted you as his own children. And now we call him <coughs> Abba, Father. Now, here we see two important things about what God wants us to pray uh, to him, what our prayers to him as our Heavenly Father are to be like. First of all, God wants my prayers to be personal. Abba, Daddy. Now, again, we have talked about this repeatedly, and we're probably going to talk about it some more in our 40 days of journey. But repetition is important, guys. We don't want it just to say something once, let it fly out of your, your mind, and you never even act on it. But repetition, when we repeat something over and over, that's the way we learn things. That's the way we remember things. And that's the way we put things that we learn into practice. So let's talk about it once again, because this is so important. I want to drive this, this truth home. Paul, speaking about addressing God, says, Now we call him Abba, Father. And as you recall, Abba is a very, very simple Aramaic word. And the very young Middle Eastern children used to address their fathers as Abba. And the English equivalent for Abba is, of course, Dada or Papa. It's one of the first words that a baby is able to say. A little baby girl looks up at her father. And, and, and she stretches out her arms to him and says, da, da. And his heart absolutely melts. Abba, da, da. That, 
that that's just an incredibly personal term. It's a very intimate way that a little child addresses her big old daddy. And it's a very unpretentious, unassuming, honest, affectionate, personal way for a little child to address their daddy. And Paul says, you know what? We can call our Heavenly Father, the creator of the universe, Abba. Da, da. So here's a homework assignment. I am very serious about this. I want you to do this. This week, start every prayer you pray with Daddy or Papa. Now, you don't have to do this for the rest of your life, but this week I'm asking you, I don't care if you're, you're praying in your devotional to, just to guide you, and you, I don't care if you're praying with your, with your wife or with your life group or, or a Bible study. This week, whenever you pray, I want us all to get in this habit to force ourselves to address God as Daddy, as Papa. The Bible tells us we can do this. I'm serious. God. I want us all to do this. I want, I want to start every prayer this week that you pray with Daddy, Dada, Papa. And you say, well, I don't, I don't really feel too comfortable about doing that. That's your problem. That's your problem. Okay? Get over it. Get out of your comfort zone. Get intimate with God. Just for a week, whenever you pray, address God as Papa or Daddy. And I want you to watch and see how if you do that, how that impacts your connection, your feeling, your love for God. God wants our prayer times with Him. He wants Him to be personal. He wants Him to be intimate. But from this passage, we see that God also wants my prayers to be passionate. Cry out. You know, most translations of Romans 8.15, and there are a lot of them, but most of them don't say, call him Abba, Father. Most of them say, cry out, Abba, Father. Do you ever cry out to God? I mean, really, cry out. Now, have you ever gotten emotional as you pray to God? Well, you know what? God is an emotional God. And we are created in His image. He's made us. He's created us to have emotions. And God loves us to share our emotions with Him. He loves us to be real with Him when we talk to Him. And to let Him know how we're really feeling inside. Whether it's rotten or fantastic. He wants to know. He wants us to tell Him. You know, sometimes you know, He wants us just to cry out to Him in prayers and say something like, Oh God, I'm hurting so badly. Oh Daddy. Help me, show me, please, what I'm supposed to do. Well, dear Father, I've got bills piling up all over the place. I have no idea how I'm going to pay them. God, please help me. Well, thank you, dear God. Thank you so much for answering that prayer. You know, just about every Saturday, I'm back in my office just about the whole day. It's me, me, and, me and God. We're working on the message. I've done all the research. I've got the outline. I kind of know where I'm going, but... That's the time, crunch time, when I'm putting it together. And man, uh, sometimes I get preachers walk. You know, I just like, gosh, I don't have an illustration of that. I just, how do I say this? What should I include? Not include? And it can be very frustrating. And I'm kind of in this dialogue with God all along. And, and he inevitably, so faithful, he, he brings uh, to me what he wants me to say. And, and, and sometimes, you know, she got to really struggling. And then all of a sudden, bang, the light bulb goes off. And God gives me the right illustration where and if you're walking by the front of the church, you would probably hear me inside say, Thank you, God! Oh, that is great. That's perfect. All right. Because it's so exciting. It's so much God doing that for me. And it excites me. You know, guys, it's important that we put a little oomph in our prayers. It's important we have some feeling in our prayers when we're talking to our Heavenly Father. So, look backward to the cross. Look upward to your Father. And number three, look inward to Jesus and the Holy Spirit living inside of me. Inward. The hand motion, both hands just come in. Boom. Inward. Okay? That's what we want to do. So, Galatians 2.20, one of my favorite verses. You know, I can remember having a quiet time and I was going to seminary and I ran across this verse. And it's just like it leaped off the page of me. This is my, my life verse. Paul says, I, old Paul. 
have been crucified with Christ. And I no longer live. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I live in this body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and delivered himself up for me. Did you know that if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, that Jesus actually lives inside of you? And so when you come to church, Jesus comes with you. When you're texting, when you should be driving, Jesus is right in there in the car with you. When you cheat on a test at school, he's there. He's watching just how you're cheating on that test. When you're sick in bed, he's there with you. When you gossip and slander about somebody behind their back, Jesus knows he's right there. He hears every word. And since Jesus is inside of us, it makes us uncomfortable when we sin. Jesus and sin, they just, they just don't, don't go along too well together. And it makes us want to do some house cleaning. Some house cleaning. It makes us want to, to work on getting rid of those lingering sins, those bad habits and hurts and hang-ups that, that seem to kind of plague us. But not only is Jesus living inside of you, if you're a Christ follower, the Holy Spirit also lives inside of you, and the Father does too, but that's another whole message. We're going to concentrate on the first two. But in 1 Corinthians 6, 18-20, the Apostle Paul writes to the believers in Corinth, Flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a man commits are outside his body. But he who sins sexually sins against his own body. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? Whom you have received from God? You're not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. Now, Paul is addressing the Corinthian of Christians, and he's saying, look, the Holy Spirit, you've accepted Jesus. That means the Holy Spirit has come in. He's taken residence. You're his temple. You're his house. That's where he lives. And you can't be sexually involved with these temple prostitutes with the Holy Spirit. You're taking the Holy Spirit into that relationship. That's just wrong. You need to stop it. That same Holy Spirit lives in us. And when you walk into an adulterous relationship, the Holy Spirit goes with you. When you watch pornography late at night, and you might think that you're all alone watching that computer screen, but you're not. The Holy Spirit and Jesus Christ have front row seats watching that same screen. Watch it, but you're watching you may not think it's a big deal to live with someone before you get married. Oh, come on. Everybody else is doing it. It's no big deal. We do blah, 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 blah. We can't afford it. You may think uh, it's no big deal, but the Holy Spirit does. <coughs> the Holy Spirit does. And when we do, when we walk into sin like it, it grieves the Holy Spirit. And so with God the Son and God the Holy Spirit living inside of it just motivates the socks off of us to look inward. To see where it is that we're sinning and to do something about it. You know, David in Psalm 139, 23 to 24, he just, boy, he just opens up his heart. He opens up his life to God. And he says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me. Know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. So guys, very important way to look, place to look when we're praying is to look inward. Look inside yourself and see if there's some sin that your Holy Spirit, your, your, your Savior Jesus wants you to confess and repent of. Okay, let's practice again. Look backwards at the cross, upwards at the Father, look inward to confess your sin, and number four, look outward and ask God to use it. Now, this one could be a little dangerous. I want you to be very careful. Don't break your person's nose that's, that's next to you. Because the, the signal is that. Okay, but that's too dangerous. We just want to stop right here. Not go back here. Here, okay. Look outward and ask God to use me. Ephesians 2.10. God tells us through his servant Paul, we are God's workmanship. Some translations say we are his masterpiece. Created in Christ Jesus to do good works, 
which God prepared in advance for us to do. That's such an important verse. It's so interesting. It comes right after we've been saved by grace through faith, not by works, lest they may boast. But then he said, yeah, but there are some work. God had stuff for you to do before the, he even created the world, okay? He wants us then to look outward. Beyond that, it's not about you all the time. He wants to look outward and serve other people. We said it before, and I'm sure I'll say it again, but Christianity is not a spectator sport. God wants all of us to be not sitting on the stands watching the other Christians do all the work on the field. No, he wants us on the playing field, in the thick of the action. He wants us in the game. 1 Peter 4.10, Peter says, Each one should use whatever gift he has received to serve others. And what that's saying is that God has given every single person in this room who's a believer, he's given you a special set of skills. He's given you a special set of, of gifts, spiritual gifts and abilities that he wants you to use, not for yourself, use to serve others. So a great thing to pray about is to ask God, Papa, show me where you want to use me today. You know, lead me to, to some hurting person who just needs an encouraging word. You know, show me, God, where, where you want me to serve in this church. Help, help me, God, not to get out of the stands and on the playing field. Use me, God. I want to be used. Myra, would you come up here for a minute? Myra is going to give us a sneak preview of her interpretive dance, which she will be performing Saturday night. Just kidding. I know. Okay. I, but she's going to share with us, take for a few minutes, some exciting way how God is currently using her. I will spare you. <laughs> um, last year, toward the end of the school year, um, I found myself at a crossroad. Um, do I stay in a position that I fell in love with, or do I go back to a position that was in my heart? You know, well, the decision was made. This was right before the Easter break. And I didn't have a piece about it. I didn't know why I didn't have a piece, and I just continued, Lord, why I don't have a piece? Do, you know, is it the wrong decision? What do you want from me? All week long, my whole break, I just thought, there's not a piece. What do you want me to do, Lord? Well, the Sunday of following, I was sitting back there, and I could multitask because I was listening as well, but I was praying, God, please reveal to me what it is you want me to do. I'm not content. I don't have peace. And believe me, the position I would be in, I was going back to people I worked wonderfully with and considered family. So why I'm not having peace, Lord, please, I need to know, I need to know. Well, the next morning, it was as clear as could be, the Lord said, email Cutoff Elementary. Oh, I'm not emailing Cutoff Elementary. <laughs> you know, like, I'm not. Because, you see, there was someone who, in the exact position I was in, was retiring, and that person had done an absolutely fabulous job, and nobody wants to follow that person, okay? <laughs> I'm not emailing cut off Lord, I'm okay. I'm good, you know. If my car breaks, I can walk to work. I'm that close. <laughs> Tuesday came, the Lord kept saying, email cut off elementary. No, Lord, uh, there's two bridges I'm gonna have to pass. Nope, I'm not emailing. Well, by Wednesday, I basically ran into my classroom and emailed cut off, is what I did. And I had an instant peace when that email was sent. I said, all right, that's it. <laughs> it. We're good. I have the peace. Well, then an email came back. Would love to interview you. Oh, okay. You know, so I went on the interview. And y'all, I was so unpolished and as raw as could be, I basically sat there and said, I'm here because the Lord told me to email you. <laughs> okay. So raw. <laughs> Anyway, did the interview, walked out, and I said, okay, Lord, if I get a call back and they want me, that's the open door. You want me to go. Now, you got to remember, I was pretty comfortable where I was at, and I was well okay where I was. 
And God said, yep, I'm going to open that door. Call Cain. They want it. Oh. Well, Lord, if I take it, you're going to make sure those bridges are closed and I can be straight up at school on time. I haven't caught one yet. <laughs> so at the same time at the school in Cutoff, there was a student that approached administration about starting a Christian club. Well, because it was toward the end of the school year, they said, well, let's wait till the beginning of the year and we're going to start fresh. Okay, fast forward to the beginning of the school year. I go to cut off. I mean, I knew a few people, but, you know, hey, went in there. And because I had previously worked with a Christian club at school, I said, well, I'm going to help out. I'm going to help you all out and get the feet going and all that good stuff. Well, because of different circumstances, long story short, I ended up the sponsor of the club. Okay. Well, this little guy, he named five, uh, four friends that he would say could help him out to lead this group. We met, we brainstormed on what the Lord wanted us to do. They told me what they knew, they told me what they wanted to know more of, and what they wanted to teach to their fellow peers. Then, oh, we gotta send permission slips out. We gotta look at what kind of number we're looking at, what kind of help we're gonna need. We sent out permission slips, and as of Friday, we have 123 children signed up, second through fifth grade. So my whole point is God's purpose would have continued as at school. But I, I'm able to be a part because I listened and I was obedient and there's peace and obedience. So if God's nudging you, just be obedient. And don't fuss like I did for two days. <laughs> Thank you. Wow. Is that exciting or what? Myra has a clear heavenly daddy. You understand why in the world God would do that? But she obeyed and she went and look how God blessed her. 123 puppies for Christ. You know, tarpons for Christ, but well, their mascot is puppies. 123 puppies for Christ. You know what? That is one third of the students in second and fifth grade. Only have 300. A third of them are doing puppies for Christ. <coughs> Praise God. You know, 1 Corinthians 15, 58, Paul exhorts and he encourages the Corinthian believers saying this. Therefore, my dear brothers, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourself fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Her labor was not in vain. You know, it is so exciting uh, to, to see God working through you. It's so exciting to see God working through your brothers and sisters in Christ. To see Him looking outward, not just themselves. You know, last week I got back from a uh, cutoff, uh, back to cutoff after my mom's funeral in Memphis. And, and uh, I had a letter up there in my box and... But somebody I read the, looked at the back. I didn't know who this person was, but I saw it was from Memphis. So it's somebody from Memphis. So I, I'd like to share this letter with you. It just touched my soul. Dear Dr. Jemison, I saw recently in the Memphis Commercial Appeal that your sweet mom had passed away and joins her sweet husband, Bill, in heaven. Your mom and dad were our neighbors when my ex-husband and I lived on Avon Road. Jimmy and I often had occasions to visit with your parents, and they were always just the nicest neighbors you could ever hope to have, going the extra mile and beyond if they needed to. One time, I called on your dad when I noticed smoke coming from the fireplace in the living room. I didn't know you couldn't put ashes in a paper sack. In no time, your dad was over with buckets of water and helped subdue the smoking sack and the charred floor beneath it. There was another time, I recall. When both your parents came over and after a very warm discussion asked if I would join hands with them. And we knelt right there on the floor and prayed that Jimmy and I could somehow get back together again. 
Sad to say that never happened. But they were such a loving, giving Christian couple. And when they moved, I was sad to see them go. Funny, I'm tearing up as I write this. How well I remember your mom's sweet and gracious demeanor. May she rest in peace long with your dad, both of whom were never shy when it came to professing their faith in Christ and modeling the importance of a prayer full life. Sincerely, Rita Bridge. Myra, Mom and Dad, so many of you are people who are looking out. You're looking outward and you're making yourself available to be used by God to do His work. Look backwards at the cross. Look upwards at the Father. Look inward as you confess your sins. Look outward to the needs of others. And finally, look forward to trusting God with my future. Let's all do look forward. Look forward. One more time. One, two, look forward. Look forward, trusting God with my future. So, really, the, the, this is talking about, now here's the time of your prayer to kind of talk about and pray about what's coming up in your future. First, maybe your, your near future. What's, what's coming up that day? You talk to God about the day that's, that's before you, and you pray things like, like, Abba, Father, would you help me prioritize my day? I've got a list of 19 things that I need to get done, and I know I'll never get to all of them. God, would you show me which ones are the most important things that you want me to get done? Can you give me the strength and the energy to get them done? And pray things like, hey, thank you for loving me. Would you help me to make the right decisions today in the right way? And give me the energy to do it. Or, Father, I'm going into a meeting this morning, and it's a tough one. Show me what to say. Show me how to say That's your near future. But also look forward further down the road, a year, five years, 10, 15, down the road. Because you know what? God wants to hear your plans and your thoughts and your ideas and your dreams. And so pray about that. God, what, where do you want me in five years? Where do you want me to be? But perhaps the most important thing in your future to pray about is your death. Your death. If you dropped dead tomorrow, do you know for sure whether or not you go to heaven? The only way to answer yes to that question is if you believe in Jesus Christ. If you trust Him and His death on the cross for the full forgiveness of your sins and receive Him into your life. Have you done that? Have you done that? Friday was in the hospital sitting next to the bed of Susan King who was dying from pancreatic cancer. In fact, she just passed last night. Susan's a believer. And so as I read verses from God's word that they were a comfort for her, she knew that her future was in heaven. Do you? You know, when everybody, somebody dies, you know, people inevitably say, well, she's in a better place. Sometimes I have to kind of bite my tongue when they say that. But if that person has died without ever trusting Christ for his or her salvation, they are not in a better place. They are in a far worse place. Jesus said, I am the way there is none other. The way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through so look forward and pray in one of two ways. Uh, if you're a believer, thank God for saving you from your sins. That's something we should thank Him for every day. Thank Him for providing this incredibly wonderful place for us to go to once we leave this world. And tell Him just how much you're looking forward to seeing Him face to face. But if you're not a believer, Pray and ask God to reveal himself to you. Ask him to open your heart, to open your mind, to be able to understand what it was that Jesus accomplished on the cross. And pray. Pray to receive Christ into your life as your own personal Lord and Savior.
Guys, these are five important places to look when you pray. And I hope this, this week to use all five of them. I mean, when you sit down, just get into this habit of, you know, and let's, let's go through the motions. I want you to look backwards at the cross, <laughs> upward at the Father, inward to confess your sins, outward to the needs of others, forward trusting God with your future. Can you do that? Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you that, uh, that you love us so much. And Father, so we, we just confess, Lord, that sometimes our prayers are so anemic. Lord, we must sound like robots to you. But Lord, help us to grow in that. Help us to, to love you and to cut out the time where we can really spend significant time praying to you. And Father, if there are those here who, who don't know what's going to happen to them if they die, they hope maybe they've been good enough, but Father, we... Your word tells us that the only way is through your son. And so, Father, there's somebody here who would like to be adopted by you. Somebody here this morning who would just love to be a child of yours. I just pray that you would lead them to quietly pray in the stillness of their heart these words. So if you want to become a Christian, just pray these words genuinely from your heart. God, I thank you for bringing me here today. God, I'm tired of slugging it out in this world on my own. I need help. God, I need you in my life. I see that you are what I'm missing. And so, Father, I just want to let you know this morning, right here where I sit, that I believe in you. I really do. I believe that your son Jesus is the son of the living God, that he is God himself. And I believe that when he died on that cross, he paid for every last one of my sins, past, present, and future. So God, I don't understand everything, but I understand this. I understand the need to ask you into my life. So Jesus, come into my life. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. Come live inside of me. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This week, Life Group. Don't miss it. I've already looked at it. It's really, really good. Don't miss your daily devotion. You know my favorite part about the daily devotion? It's writing out that little prayer at the end. You kind of look at it, meditate it. I don't know about you, but when I write, man, I start... It just brings more thoughts. I don't have enough room on that whole page to write that prayer. But do that. Work around those prayers. And guys, come back next week. Enjoy this 40 days of prayer. Thank you.